So good afternoon, good evening. My name is Mark Mitwitz. I'm a member of the Bates Adult Education Committee. Anybody who's had the task of coming up with a Dvar Torah for a wedding or a bar mitzvah or other life cycle events will be accustomed to looking at that week's Parsha for inspiration and to find a connection. Speaking from a bit of experience, some parshat are easier to work with than others. But, you know, but finding a link to the parsha can play a much deeper and more profound role in how we conduct our lives. In his book, The Journey to Your Ultimate Self, Rabbi Shmuel Rechman delves into what he calls a gateway into Jewish thought through the lens of the weekly parsha. Rabbi Shmuel Rechman is an educator, speaker, and executive coach who has lectured internationally on topics of Torah thought, Jewish medical ethics, psychology, and leadership. After obtaining his BA from Yeshiva University, he received Smircha from Yeshiva University's REITS program, a master's degree in education, a master's degree in Jewish thought, and then he spent a year studying at Harvard as an Ivy Plus scholar. Wow. Rabbi Reichman recently moved to Chicago with his wife and son, where he gives shiurim. I assume that's Rabbi Reichman gives a shiurim, not your son. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and is pursuing a PhD at the University of Chicago. I'm very, very pleased to welcome Rabbi Reichman to Thornhill virtually and to the bait. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's, it's a challenge to speak online when you're not speaking face to face, but I've spent years speaking to a camera. That's how you can and, and, and if I could just, I won't, I won't interrupt you. If anybody's comfortable turning on your camera, you're welcome to do so. If you feel more comfortable not doing so, by all means. But if you like, I'm sure the rabbi would like to see your faces if that's possible. So that's what I was going to say is that everyone should feel comfortable to do whatever they want. You can ask questions. I mean, at the end, I'll definitely be happy to spend time um, receiving and answering questions. But what I want to do is something a little special. I want to delve really, really deep into why I wrote this. Safe. And I want to delve into some of the underlying themes. But I do want to tell you a little bit of a, a reflective. I mean, I've given this year, I've given this presentation many, many times. And when we actually set the date for this presentation, for this, for this lecture and event, uh, the book had just come out. So we were planning on having the book available a little bit before everything was very, very different than now because the past couple of months have been nothing short of transformative for me because I spent about four years writing this book and I had no idea what the response would be like. This is my first book. So I haven't done this before. It's not something that I was an expert at. And I thought maybe you take, you know, in the Jewish world, books don't really sell out. So it usually takes a couple of years for the first print to sell out. And this book sold out within the first couple of weeks. So we are now on the second print and it's also selling very quickly. And the impact is nothing short of transformative. It's, it's incredible. I get emails, I get texts, I get pictures, I get messages. And this was, this is an author's dream to have an actual impact with the book that you write. But what I want to do is I want to take you into the universe of this book, because this book is a little different. And I'm going to try to explain why it's different. It's not a normal Parsha book. It's not a normal book. It's designed to be transformative. It's designed to open your mind. It's designed to take you into the deepest ideas of Torah, the deepest ideas of Torah thought, but in an inspiring way. And I want to give you a gateway into the gateway. I want to take you into the essence of the book. I want to start with a story. And the story is of a carpenter. And this carpenter loves what he does. He's the best at what he does. And he spends his entire life building houses. But he's getting old. And he's ready to retire. He's, he's done enough. He's built enough houses. So what he does is he goes over to his boss. <clears throat> Sorry, he goes over to his boss and he says, I'm ready to call it quits. I'm ready to retire. And his boss is not so happy because this guy's his best worker. So he says, can you build us one more house? And the worker says, I don't really have it in me. I can't really build any more houses. But the boss insists and he says, just one more, just one more house. So he thinks it over and he says, okay, I'll build one more house. So he starts to build it, but he's just not into it. And He's built incredible houses in the past, but this house he's just not really building. It's shy of craftsmanship. It's, you know, things aren't really, he's not really putting his all into it. And then things are crooked, things aren't really in place, and it's just not his best work. 
but he does it. A couple months later, he goes over to his boss and he says, I built my house, I finished. And his boss is smiling. And he notices something strange. Every person who he's ever worked with is in the room. He's thinking, this is real, what's going on? His boss smiles, goes into his pocket and pulls out some keys. Goes over to him, cans in the keys and says, these are the keys to the house. You just built your own house. This is our going away present to you. You get to keep the house. And obviously what happens? He's crushed. And why is he crushed? Because he just built his own house, but he built a piece of garbage. He thought he was building someone else's house. It's not like he would normally build a piece of garbage if he was building someone else's house, but he just wasn't into it. And if he knew he was building his house, he would have been passionate and focused and driven. He would have built the best house he'd ever built. But he didn't. And now he gets to experience the shame of what he could have built. And this is a powerful story. And we all relate to the, the sadness in the story, but it actually opens up a very powerful theme in Torah thought because the Maharal, the Ramchal, the Ramban, they open up a topic which is very often misunderstood. It's the topic of Ulam Haba, the world to come. And most people, if you ask them, what's the world to come? They'd say that, you know, I, I do mitzvahs. I serve God in this world. I'm an Eved Hashem. I serve God. And then I get reward in Olam Haba. But when I ask you, what's the reward? Most people would say, like, my neshama, my soul gets to experience some, you know, some reward. So the Ramchal, the Maharal, the Ramban, the many, many, many Jewish thinkers, they revolutionize this concept where they say that no, it's not that your soul gets to experience some reward. You do. Because you are a soul. You are an inner consciousness, a lofty being. You are, when you say I, that's who you're referring to. That's you, right? So when you say I, you're referring to your soul. You're referring to your, your mind, your inner self. And they explain that when you die, you simply walk outside your body. You continue being. So it's not, you know, your soul, your some lofty thing is going to experience this reward. It's you. But the reward is not some external reward. The reward is you. It's who you built. It's the house you built. It's the ideas, the ideals, the philosophy, the inner world, the inner contract, who you developed, how you molded and crafted yourself, how you decided to develop yourself, how you learned, how you worked on your meters, worked on your character, to developed your mind, developed your inner self. You experience you. And the joy is everything you earned, everything you built, and the pain is everything you didn't. It's getting to experience the house you could have built. And in essence, if you really want to think about it, this is what Shabbos says. Shabbos, the Gemara in Brachos Tafun Zayin, the Gemara says in Talmud that Shabbos is me'in olam haba. Shabbos is a taste, me'in, a taste of olam haba, the world to come. Why? Because on Shabbos, we stop creating. Malacha, we don't do malacha on Shabbos. Malacha means most people translate it as work, but malacha actually comes from the same shoresh, the same root as a malach, as an angel. Malacha is creative activity. An angel is a creation of Hashem, a creative emanation from Hashem. And malacha is creative activity. And on Shabbos, we stop creating. You're not allowed to create. What are you supposed to do on Shabbos? You're supposed to be. Right? It's the stopping of the process of building and becoming, and you experience very powerfully everything you've become. And that's why people who are building themselves, who are working on themselves, who are pushing the boundaries and their own limitations, are trying to achieve their greatness. Shabbos is amazing because you get to experience who you've become, and then you recalibrate. You say, what am I going to build this week? And when you're on that journey, Shabbos becomes amazing. But for many people, this idea of achieving greatness, of striving to grow, of striving to connect to Hashem, striving to become the best version of yourself, it's very difficult. And the reason why it's so difficult for so many people is because of the problem of miscommunication. How do you define greatness? What is greatness? This is a question which can drive people nuts. It can drive people crazy because what does greatness mean? If you define greatness in the wrong way, then you can convince yourself it's not for you. So it's like words are just mediums of communication. But when you don't question the word and open it up and understand the abstraction, how to decipher the meaning of the word, of the concept, of the mitzvah, of the idea, you just 
translate it in one way and assume it's that way. So if you're translating, for example, you can say, I love pizza. You can say, I love you to your spouse. It's the same word. You know, it hopefully means something very different. But the, the idea that words have a definitive meaning is the exact opposite of thought. Thought is opening up words, concepts, ideas, phrases, terms, mitzvahs, and deepening your level of understanding of what they are. So when you don't know how to communicate or you don't know how to think, then you can very often go through your entire life mistranslating ideas, concepts, words, etc. And it can limit your level of experience on all fronts of life. And miscommunication, I mean, miscommunication is, is like, it's the, it's the S, it's the essential struggle of being a human being. When you talk to someone, you don't know if they're actually hearing what you're saying or just the words that you're saying and translating it the way that they understand those words. Genuine communication is difficult. To truly be heard or to truly hear, it takes effort, it takes empathy, it takes a struggle of trying to genuinely get outside yourself. And I'll share a, I'll share a story that, that happened to me a couple months ago. I was, it was Friday afternoon and I needed some whole wheat challahs for Shabbos. Because my wife and I, we like to eat whole wheat challahs. My wife, we went, we opened up the fridge, opened up the freezer, we couldn't find any. My wife asked me, can you get some whole wheat challahs from the store? I said, sure, shalom bayis, of course. Went to the store and I tried to find some whole wheat challahs and I couldn't. And I looked everywhere. I looked up, I looked down, looked all down the aisles, couldn't find them. So I went over to one of the workers and I said, excuse me, do you have any whole wheat challahs? And the worker's eyes lit up. He's like, whole wheat, of course, I have whole wheat. And I said, because I don't see any aisles, do you like, you know, he's like, oh, come with me, come with me, I'll, I'll take you. And I said, okay, great, thank you. Started going with him. And he took me straight past the aisle, straight past the food section to the back of the store. I'm thinking, okay, just in storage. But then we go right past the kitchen, we go past the storage area. And I turned to him, I said, like, well, like I, we're going for whole wheat challahs, right? He's like, whole wheat, whole wheat, of course, whole wheat. And I said, okay, the, do you know, like, are we sure we're going the right place? He's like, yeah, just come with me, come with me. All the way to the back of the store. Right? And we're going past these like offices now. And it's like some really well-hidden challahs. I have no idea what's going on at this point. And we go all the way past and we start going up the stairs. And we go to the top floor. And at this point, I'm thinking like, what in the world is going on? And we get to the manager's office. And he knocks on the door of the manager's office. And as the manager's open the door, I read the name of the manager and my heart sinks because as the door opens, I read that his name is Howie, right? And the door opens and the worker's smiling. He says, Howie, Howie. And then the worker just walks away. And I had to explain to the manager of the office that manager of the store that I wasn't looking for Howie. I was looking for whole wheat, challahs. And the manager was obviously a little sad because no one ever comes to visit him. So he thought that someone finally came to say hi. So, um, and the story did not have a happy ending. There were no holy chalos left. I had, to, <laughs> I had to go somewhere else. But this is the essence of miscommunication. It's a cute story, but this is what happens whenever you hear someone talk. They could be saying words, ideas, concepts, and you could be translating in a way fundamentally different from the way that they actually mean it. And it's the same thing in the Torah. It's the same thing in Mitzvah, same thing in Halacha, same thing in any... Any aspect of learning, unless you open things up, question and deepen, you're going to be left with not only a surface level, but whatever level that you had previously had, you're going to project onto that. So the concept of greatness, the concept of greatness is one of the most misunderstood concepts. And the, the greatest source in the Torah in my opinion, the greatest source for really opening up this topic is a very famous Gemara, famous Gemara in Nida the Flamen Amabes, which talks about the story, the, this almost the mythology of what happens when you and I are in the womb, right? When we're a fetus in the womb. And the Gemara says that while we're in the womb, we learn Kola Torah Kula. We learn all of Torah. And you're thinking, like, that's very, that's inspiring. Wow, it's amazing. And this Malach, this angel who teaches us all of Torah, does something very anticlimactic at the very end of, of this entire process. Right before you're born, the angel hits you and you forget all of it, all the Torah that you learned. You forget everything. And then you're born. So everyone asks the same question on this Gemara, which is, 
what's going on? Right? Why is this angel making you forget everything that he taught you? But more importantly, if he's going to make you forget it, why teach in the first place? Seems to be a waste of time. But the Vilna Gun says something unbelievable. He says that when you were learning Kol Atoroku, when you were learning all of Torah, you weren't just learning Gemara or Chumash or Rashi. You weren't learning the, the surface level of Torah. You were learning the cosmic purpose, like the deeper realms of Torah. You were learning the purpose of all of reality, the purpose of creation. But more importantly, you were being learned your purpose. You were being taught who you were supposed to be. You were learning your essence. You were learning your role in the world, what you were designed to become. And each of us are unique. Each of us, think of that. You, you learn in your own way. You think in your own way. You experience life in your own way. You were designed in your unique way. And the Vilna Gun says, and this is the most important part, you don't lose what you learned in the womb. You lose access to it. And the reason is because what you got in the womb was free. It was a root. It was what you're capable of becoming. But that's not real. That was a gift. Your job is to come into this world and build it and learn it and express it. It's like Michelangelo was once asked, how do you build these amazing sculptures? And he smiled and he said, the, the sculpture already exists beneath this slab of stone. I just have to remove everything on the surface. I have to reveal what's already there. So many people think that they're in this world to try to strive to become great, but they're actually supposed to strive to become themselves. So real greatness is not becoming great, it's becoming you. It's becoming the greatest version of you, the true version of you, which is great, but not objective. Like we're not in a capitalistic normal society. That's not the way the world works. It's not about becoming the best you can be. No one cares about you becoming the best you can be. It's about results, right? You don't get the job because you're trying hard and you have a good attitude. You get the job because you're the best at what you do. But in life, when it comes to self-worth, when it comes to value, when it comes to how you see yourself, it's not about external comparison. It's not about results. It's about you striving to become you. And that's also why when you learn deep ideas, then you often have this experience like you're recognizing it. Like you're just, like when someone says something really deep and you're like, whoa, like that just hit home. Why? Like you never heard it before. Why does it because you did hear it before. You are re-experiencing, you're re-accessing your fetal state. You're re-accessing that you know, objective wisdom that you're already tapped into. It's the famous Lockean you know, Plato debate where Locke claimed that we were a blank slate. That our mind just a blank slate, like a blank piece of paper. And as you learn through life, you just write things onto your mind. You project onto yourself. But Plato had this idea of objective ideas of this, you know, the, the platonic system where there are genuine ideas and that is very deep in the sense that we, we're not learning and just building ourselves. We're tapping into a deep metaphysical root that already exists. We're tapping into a deep part of ourselves that already exists. And that's how learning becomes enjoyable when you start to allow ideas to resonate, to almost synergize with yourself. And the book that I wrote, the, this book, The Journey to Your Ultimate Self, it's built on this premise. It's built on the premise that we are in this world to strive to become great, to become our ultimate selves. And the essence of the book is taking the deepest ideas of Torah, the most fundamental concepts and principles, and giving you an inspiring gateway into that realm of thought. And I wrote this book. And as I started giving shirim, as I started talking about this book, my dad, my father sent me a message and he said, you're never going to believe this, but at your bris, at your circumcision, I actually shared that very Gemara. That Gemara and Nida da Flama base. I shared that Gemara. And he told me this, it must have been a couple, it must have been about seven months ago. And it, it shook my world because I had written the book already. The book was ready. And the essence of the book was this Gemara. And he said, I shared that Gemara at your bris. And the, the more incredible follow-up to that story is that that was a month before the birth of my beautiful son, Yosef Baruch. And as you can probably guess where this was going, I shared that same Gemara at his breast as well. And this Gemara is, is a Gemara, it's an idea, the principle, the paradigm, it's, a, it's a, a window into seeing the world in a different way. When you view yourself as 
not how can I become better than other people? How can I become good enough for other people? How can I get people to accept me? How can I, you know, fit in? But you ask yourself, who am I? What's my purpose? What am I made of? How do I think? How do I learn? How, what is my essential internal reality? Life becomes a journey of self-awareness. And it's the most amazing journey of all time. And the essence of this book as well is also not just giving you deep fundamental principles and philosophical concepts, but it's designed to help you live Torah, to live these ideas. So for example, at the end of every single chapter, each chapter starts off, by the way, with an inspiring story that frame, fundamentally frames the concepts and ideas in each chapter. And then at the end of the chapter, there's a summary of all of the main points, because what happens very often when you learn philosophical ideas you end up saying like, that was deep, that was powerful, but I don't actually remember what I learned. Like that was new. It, 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 whenever you your mind bends, whenever you struggle to think, to actually then recall what you learned is difficult. So what I did is I have the bullet points of the main principles, ideas, and concepts of each chapter at the end of each chapter. And then there's also discussion questions based on the concepts in the chapter, so you can bring the ideas into family discussion, into your Shabbos table discussion, whether it's, you know, or maybe with your spouse or on a date or with your children, it brings it into a social environment. So you're not just learning it and closing the book, but you bring it into your life. And most importantly, there's action points. So every single chapter has ways to take the conceptual ideas and live them because the greatest distance in the world is between the head and the heart. It's very easy to think about ideas and then go back to your life. But to live ideas, you have to have a channel, you have to have a bridge, you have to have a way to implement. So there are practical tools and ways to implement and apply the ideas into each chapter. And what I wanna do is I wanna delve into some of the ideas of the Safer, but I wanna just take a little bit of a step back and I wanna share a little bit of my story as to really why I wrote the Safer. Well, what the, what the, what the internal story of the purpose of the Sefer really is. Because when I was younger, I was a very normal person. Like Baruch Hashem, you know, I've, I've been blessed to inspire and impact hundreds of thousands of people. But I had zero desire to do that when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was, I'd wanted to be a normal person, just fit in, have people like me, be, you know, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to just be a normal person. And I went to Israel to study for a couple of years. I went to Shalavin and my life fell apart. I started to lose consciousness every single day. I started to pass out every single day. And it wasn't just passing out, right? Because if you've passed out, you know that you know, it's not very nice, but you, you wake up. This was different. I had this pain in my chest and then that pain spread to my head. And then I didn't just lose consciousness. I couldn't wake back up. I had to struggle to come back to consciousness. And this happened every single week for about five months. The doctors had no idea what was happening. And I started to think I was going to die. And I started having a midlife crisis at the age of 18. But I started asking myself questions that most kids my age don't ask, which is like, why am I here? What's my purpose? What is the purpose of life? And I started to delve into everything. And I became fascinated with the concept of greatness because I wanted to pursue greatness. I said, if I'm not going to be here for so long, I may as well try to become something with the time I have left. And you know, thank God it's something called vasovagal and it's not dangerous. It's not lethal as long as you know how to prevent it, as long as you know how to at least prevent yourself from falling on your head, make sure you lie down when the symptoms come on. But even though the, the struggle of that time, and by the way, when it was happening, I used to... I used to just call out to Hashem and say, why is this happening to me? Like, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not trying to kill anybody. I'm just trying to live my life. What, why is this happening to me? But that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it woke me up to the fact that I wasn't living a meaningful life. I wasn't, there was, if I would ask myself, why am I doing this? Why am I thinking like this? Why am I acting like this? Why do I have these friends? Why do I dress this way? There was no real reason. There's no depth and foundational premise to my life. And I started to question everything. I started to say, why am I doing this? What's the value of this? What's the purpose of this? I started to do that to everything and to open up everything. And greatness was the most important principle that I opened up because I used to think that there were great people and there were people like me. 
right? They're people who are born different. They're born special. They're just more intelligent, more brilliant, more good looking. They have more money. They have better. Everything is just, they're different, right? I'm going to sit here and be normal and people who are exceptional or great on the front lines, they're just different. It's not true. Two principles. Number one is Greatness is not objective. So greatness is becoming the greatest you can be. But number two is that you have no idea who you can become. You have no idea what your potential is. If you truly pushed yourself to the limits for the rest of your life, you can literally become world-class great. The question of what you'll become great in is the question. But the question of whether you can become great, like actually great, every single person but what stops us? We're scared. We're scared. Maybe we'll fail. What will people think of us? Maybe it's not going to be all that it seems to be. Maybe I'm just not worthy. Maybe, you know, we'll, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable. I'm going to have to give up my comforts. I'm going to have to go into the unknown. There's so many reasons why people don't do it. But the essential principle that I started pursuing was what am I capable of? And I started to pursue greatness on all fronts. You know, educationally, that's a level, but here's the problem with the educational system. It's great to get degrees, but most people get degrees for the sake of prestige, to be well-known, to be accepted, to be famous. When it comes to what's really important in life, the question is, who are you? Like when you're alone by yourself, with yourself, how does that feel? Who, who are you actually inside? Not how people see you, not how you think people see you, because you have no idea what people actually think of you, but who are you? And that's what Torah is. Torah is meant to open you up and guide you to becoming extraordinary, to living your ultimate self on all fronts, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, physically, financially, relationship-wise, building yourself up and journeying towards the truth, towards Hashem, towards your ultimate purpose and contributing yourself to the Jewish people and to the world as a whole, becoming great and then contributing that greatness to others. But what's the problem with academia? The problem with academia, the problem with academia is that it's analytical, right? It's all about critical thinking, but the design of academia is not to transform the way you live life. And most people, most people live Torah where it's something that you check off, right? And, and you know, I'm sure you know people like this where they have to fulfill their requirement of listening to a shir, of davening, of doing a mitzvah. And it's, you know, checklists, things that you have to check off. But when you go to a Torah shir, when you go to a lecture, the idea isn't that you're being a good person by going to lecture. It's supposed to change the way you see the world, to change the way you experience life, to change the way you think, to change the way you see yourself, the Jewish people, your friends, your spouse, Hashem. Life is supposed to be this transformative journey. And when I was younger, I thought that the Jewish people needed more inspiration. I thought that people needed, you know, I love inspirational speakers. I've studied Tony Robbins for years and years and years. But inspiration is surface level. It's high energy, it's exciting, it's motivating, but it's fleeting. And the reason is because it's not sustainable. What actually is, with the Jewish people, what we really need is not motivation, it's depth with motivation. When you can synthesize it, for example, how often do you know the greatest intellectual thinkers who are awful speakers? And the most inspirational, motivational speakers, they're, they're airheads, right? They don't have any, they're not actually saying anything. It's a bunch of fluff. When you can bridge that gap between high, like exciting, inspiring, motivating, but with depth and fundamental ideas and concepts and principles and things that make you think and change the way you see things and fundamentally shift your paradigms and your perspectives, that's the most incredible synthesis. And when you think of Torah as a journey of becoming, as opposed to just fulfilling your requirements, where yes, it's a requirement, it's a chiv, right? But the fundamental nature of the chiv is for you to become awesome, for you to become the greatest version of yourself, and for you to discover yourself. Like most people, they think that you have to give up who you are for Hashem. 
So serving God means giving up who you are for what God wants you to do. But the Maharal talks about how mitzvah comes from the lush and the, the language, the root of tzavta, connection. How mitzvahs, mitzvahs connect you to Hashem and to your true self. And it's about finding who you really are as opposed to giving up who you are. And the essence of Torah learning becomes this transformative experience of learning the truth and living the truth. And that's the most amazing thing. It's why, it's why I love Bali Chiva. You know, Bali Chiva, the most wonderful thing about people who are, are, are growing in their, in their Judaism, they you know, aren't, weren't born religious or they you know, weren't as religious and are becoming more religious. The beautiful thing about someone like that is they know that they don't know. So they ask questions. They question everything and they want to learn. They want to think, they want to ponder, they want to deepen. They actually are searching. They actually are growing because they know they're not where they want to be. They know they want to be better. But when you're born from, when you're born religious, you very often go through the motions and you, you stop learning, you stop thinking, you stop questioning because you think that you know. And when you think that you know, you can't learn. And when you realize that there's an infinite spectrum of depth, that you're never there, you can always deepen. You can, that's why the Ramchal and many others, they say that every Jew, everyone's about tshuva. Because who are we returning to? We're returning to Hashem, but Baalei tshuva, that's why the concept of tshuva and El is not an El concept, it's a lifelong concept, because what are we returning to? to our fetal selves, to our ideal selves. We are becoming who we are destined to become. But to take that journey means admitting that you don't yet know. And admitting that you don't yet know requires being vulnerable and being real and being willing to get outside the comfort of where you are and actually go to where you want to be. And most people, they don't want to change. They don't want to give up whatever it is that you're doing because it's difficult because they don't know it. But when you view life itself as growth, you're willing to do it. Why? Because there's no, other, there's no alternative. There, why else are you here? Why else are we here? What else would we be doing with our lives? You can, you can kind of go into zombie mode and numb the desire for meaning and purpose and growth by you know, just wasting away time. But every time that you open yourself to the possibility of what we could actually become, it's very sad to say, like, I'm just not taking that journey. But once you take that journey, there's no going back because a different way of living life. And is it going to be difficult? Of course. But there's a great saying that if you do what's easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what's hard, your life will be easy. And what that means is that you can take the easy path, but your life will be meaningless, but you can take the more difficult path and your life will be extraordinary. It's like building muscle. You, you look in a gym and you see someone building muscle, right? They're lifting weights. What, what do they look like? They look like they're being tortured, right? If you, if you were an alien and you, you know, were looking in the window, you would think that that person has a gun to their head. Right? And they're being forced to like suffer and torture themselves. But not only aren't they being forced to do it, they're paying to do it. Why? Because the only way that they can grow is if they tear their muscles apart. That's how you build muscle. It's the same thing spiritually. The only way you grow is if you push yourself past your limits, if you strive. And when you start taking that journey, life becomes amazing. So the essence of this book, the essence of the Sefer, is to give you a gateway into real thought. Because there are ways to learn Torah where you're learning things you've learned a hundred times before, right? You're not learning anything new. You are fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. You are learning Torah, but you're not actually thinking. You're not pushing your mind. You're not actually changing the way you see the world. You're not being forced to go into a realm of thought because you're just going through the motions. But this book is designed to take you into ideas that shift your thinking, that open you up, that transform you, that motivate you, that drive you into the realms of, of Torah thought that are usually more inaccessible, usually in the realm of thought that if you aren't the type of person who would normally delve into deep Torah, you wouldn't normally learn through these ideas. But I've, I've gotten emails, I've gotten messages from teenagers, teenagers who are going to do the safer. Now, the safer, like we have like 
rabbis, people who are extraordinarily learned, who are enthralled with this book, enthralled with the Sefer. We also have younger people who are being introduced to this realm of Torah, who are in love with the fact that it's accessible, that it's inspiring, that it's not beyond them. And what I want to do is I want to share one or two of the fundamental principles, because there's many ways that we could, I can take you through some of the chapters, I can take you some of the ideas, but I want to give the underlying premise, the underlying framework of how the book works and what this book actually is. And I think that there are two main ideas. And the first idea, the first idea is the concept of oneness and interconnectedness. And anyone who's, who's thought out knows that there's different ways of thinking, right? You can think, for example, just in general, you can think with extremes, right? So you can take one political perspective or another political perspective. You can take one extreme view or another extreme view. But the way to build a systematic, harmonized, balanced view of everything is to build one. So for example, what's truth? Most people, they think truth is a statement, is a fact, is a, you know, something that you can point to. You know, I'm pursuing the truth and the truth is, this is the truth. But the truth is actually a conglomerate, it's interconnectedness, it's a oneness of various pieces coming together into a wholeness. And if I were to share, let's say, I'll give you a story. A kid comes to his dad and says, you know, Joe punched me in the face. Joe punched me in the face. So goes over to Joe and says, why do you punch my son in the face? Because Shimmy kicked me. He goes over there, Shimmy. Goes over there, Shimmy, you kicked Joe? Yeah, because he pushed me down the stairs. Joe, you pushed him down the stairs? Yeah, because he was calling me names. So who's telling the truth? They're all telling, they're, both of them are telling the truth. They're just telling you pieces of the truth. But the actual whole truth is the whole story. It's putting all those pieces together. So when it comes to Torah, there are ways of isolating aspects of Torah. And for anyone who really has learned Torah, there's halacha, there's gemara, right? There's mishnais and there's gemara. There's the rishonim, the people who comment on the Talmud, on the gemara. Then there's achronim, later commentaries. Then there's hashkafa, you know, in terms of values, uh, living a Jewish value life. There's machshava, Jewish philosophy. There's musr, self-development. There's so many different realms of Torah, and it's very easy to break them up and isolate them so that they're completely distinct and separate. But Torah is interconnected. It's oneness, which means that to understand anything, you have to understand everything. And the beauty of that is seeing the interconnectedness and the beauty of science, science, Right? You learn physics, you learn philosophy, you learn biology. The brilliance of science is that it's systematic, it's principle-based, and if you plug something into the system, it affects everything else. Right? There are equations, there are ways that things work and interconnect. Torah is beyond science, but it has the greatness of science as well. As in, everything holds up to the greatness of science, and it is also beyond that. So the interconnectedness, the fact that everything reflects everything else, that it's not just a bunch of random facts and, and ideas, but they all come together to create this brilliant interconnected framework, like a neural system where everything affects everything and interconnects with everything. The brilliance of Torah is understanding that if you open up every to any topic, any sugya in shas, any, any topic in Talmud, Every topic connects to every other topic. To really understand something, you have to understand everything, which means that there's a beauty that whenever you learn something, you want to bring everything you know to the table, but you also want everything you learn to affect everything else that you know, like, like a chemical explosion almost. You also want to realize that there's a hierarchy of ideas. Now, learning how to really think means understanding the hierarchy of ideas. Now, you look at a tree, right? There's the seed, which becomes, let's say, like the roots in the trunk, and then that becomes expressed. So then you have big branches, but those branches have smaller branches. The so smaller branches have smaller branches, and ultimately you have leaves. So if you think of every mitzvah, every commandment as a leaf, it's interconnected with every other leaf. There are different expressions, but they share common roots, and they share bigger roots. And the more... For example, if you learn a deep idea about tzitzis, that's brilliant. If you learn a deep idea about the physical world, that changes thousands of other principles. As in, the more root that you go, the more fundamental the concept, the more that if you shift something, it has a, a, a 
exponentially bigger effect. And if you change the way you see Hashem, it changes everything. It changes the way you see yourself, it changes the way that you see the concept of mitzvahs. The more deep, the deeper you go into something and the more you change the way you understand a concept or a principle that's deeper and more at root, the more it affects everything else. So if you change the way you see a leaf, definitely important, but if you change when you see a branch, a bigger branch, the trunk, the seed itself, that's how thinking becomes revolutionary, but also it's vulnerable because you have to give up the way you currently see something or at least be willing to bend and expand the way you see something into something more. And the idea that Torah, that Torah has this awesomeness, has this interconnectedness, has this brilliance. That's something where I've I've studied at Harvard, I've studied at the University of Chicago, I've you know, plenty of degrees. Torah is the greatest wisdom imaginable. It transcends that wisdom infinitely so. And it's not to say that other wisdom isn't useful and important. It, tr it truly is. But to have the awe and admiration for Torah thought is the greatest characteristic you can possibly have. To be in love with Torah, to be enthralled. Think about the things in your life that you cannot but do, that you are addicted to. Everybody has an addiction, right? Some people are addicted to TV. Some people are addicted to junk food. Some people are addicted to cigarettes, alcohol, you know, you know, recognition, fame, everyone has their addiction. When you become addicted to thought, to Torah, to growth, you cannot but do it. You are drawn to it. Something amazing happens. When you have spare time, what are you drawn to? When you become drawn to thinking, to writing down things, to developing things, to developing your thought, to developing yourself, you're just living on a different playing field than everyone else. And that's what Torah is designed to do. It's to open you up. When Torah speaks to you, that's why you want to find your chilek in Torah. You want to find the parts of Torah that really speak to you. But the book, this book is designed to open you up to ideas, to principles, to concepts, to not just facts, not just cute vartlach, not just cute things that you can say at the Shabbos table, but things that will literally change your life. And I know because it changed mine and it's changed thousands of people's lives. And the last principle that I want to share with you, the one of the most important concepts in life. And it's the question of how you see the physical world. How do you see the physical world? Because philosophers will tell you the physical world is just a place, right? You're here to contemplate, to develop, to connect to the realm of truth, but it's just a place. But what is the, and to take a step further, what's the spiritual? What do, what do we mean by the spiritual? I mean, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands because most people's cameras are off, but you know, by raise of hands just to yourself, how often do you hear the rabbi, the mower, the teacher end off the sermon, end off the, the shir, end off the lecture by saying, we should connect to the spiritual, we should connect to Hashem, we should connect. And you smile and you say, yes, yes, we should. What does that mean? Ask, if you ask the teachers themselves, ask the rabbi, ask, ask them, what, what do you mean connect to the spiritual? I guarantee you 50% will just shrug their shoulders and say, oh, you know, you know what I, it's, you know, you know, it's, it's what, what do you mean? Like they were taught that you were supposed to say that. And we're all taught that you're supposed to nod your head. What does that mean? And some of them will just say that it's, you know, connecting to Hashem, connecting to the spiritual, connecting to, like that's for the elite, the, the rabbis, the philosophers, the people who spend all their day working on themselves. But for everyone else, you know, you do your job, be a good person and you know, hope to one day experience something good, but it's not really for you. But the Ramchal and the Maharal and the Ramban, many, many, many others, they fundamentally change this conversation because when you understand what the physical and what the spiritual actually is, it changes the way you see everything in life. So for example, there's a famous midrash. Istakil Baraisa Baraama. It's a midrash rabba. It's a, it's a Rabbah. 
that Hashem used the Torah, Stakel Baraisa used the Torah to create what? Stakel Baraisa Baraam, used the Torah to create the physical world. Which means that the physical is an expression of the spiritual, right? You take a, a, a human being that came from what? A zygote, right? So the zygote expressed itself into a fully developed human being. Take a seed, expresses itself into a tree, into a fully grown tree. You, you have a projector, right? It projects onto a screen. You, what you see on the screen came from that projector. It's an emanation. It's an expression. It's an unfolding. It's ultimately what? The expression can be seen as a reflection of the root, which means that to understand the root, you look at the expression. To understand the expression, you look at the root. The two are connected. They parallel. Now, the root's more fundamental, Right, the seed is more fundamental. If you look at a seed, you can see what type of tree it will become. You look at a zygote, you can see the genes, what that human being will ultimately become. But from the expression, you can also trace it back to its source. So when Istakal Brahsa Brahma, when the physical world is an expression of Torah, is an expression of the spiritual, that means the finite is a reflection of the infinite. The physical is a reflection of the spiritual. The corporeal is a reflection of the transcendent. And that means what? that we're not in this world to transcend the physical. We're here to uplift it. So think about how many mitzvahs are purely mental, meditative, spiritual mitzvahs. You probably count them on your hand, right? Believe in God. Don't serve idolatry. Don't be jealous. Almost all commandments are physical. Why? Right? Shake lulav, eat matzah, wear tefillin. Why? Because the purpose of living a spiritual life is not transcending the physical, but it's uplifting and using the physical and seeing it as a reflection of the spiritual. That's why we don't say be celibate and don't engage in marriage. We have a mitzvah of peruvah. We have a mitzvah of procreating, having children. Uh, as soon as a child's eight days old, a boy, we do bris mila, right? We uplift the organ that can be you know, potentially purely animalistic. We say we're going to uplift that and use it for kedusha, for holiness. But the idea is not transcending our physicality. It's transforming and uplifting. It's learning how to integrate your spiritual, mental, intellectual, emotional, physical, financial relationship. All components of life are meant to be interconnected and used to the ideal, to the highest level. And that's what Torah is. That's why the Ram Maharal explained that Savta, mitzvot, are physical actions that you use to connect to Hashem. Why are we connecting to Hashem through physical? Why don't we transcend the physical? Because the physical is spiritual. It's our medium of connection. It's how we connect to the spiritual. That's why when you eat food, you literally there's a mitzvah, there's a bracha, there's a way of transforming, uplifting every element of physical life, not because it's low, but because we are ascending with it. And that's the essence, by the way, of Spheres Omer, of what we're building right now. We start from Pesach, right? We start from barley and we go to lechem, right? We start from the physical, but we don't transcend the physical. We uplift it. We ascend. Spheres Omer, the Maharal explains, we're not counting, right? Why, why do we count, by the way? Why do we count? Right? We count and do we count down like you do for everything you're excited for? We count up, right? When you're excited for a birthday, you say five, four, three, two, one. You're excited for graduation, school year can end. You count, you know, counting down the days till you graduate. But for Spheres Omer, for counting to Shavuos, to Man Torah, we count up. Why? Because the Maharal explains we're not counting, we're building. We're building from the physical to the spiritual. And that's why we don't count, we don't count towards Shavuos, we count from the Omer. The Omer was brought already. Why aren't we counting towards Shavuos? Because when you build something, you build a foundation, you build a skyscraper, you build a strong foundation, you build up. We are building towards, but we don't escape the physical, we use it. That is the essence, that's why the concept of being a human being is being a human becoming, of understanding how to grow in this world, not to ascend and transcend it, but to use it. And the beauty of living in this world, the beauty of living in this world is understanding how to live a transcendent life in this world. Right? It's understanding how to see the miraculous. For example, we just came from Pesach. Pesach is very, very different than Purim. Right? Pesach, Hashem openly revealed himself to the world. There were open miracles and makos, and there was Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. Then the manna came from Shemayim, came from heaven. It was a miraculous time. But 
something happened in Jewish history where that stopped. There's no more prophecy. There's no more miracles. There's no more open miracles. Purim, what was the miracle of Purim? There was no open miracle of Purim. How many times is Hashem mentioned in the Megillah? The Megillah asked that we read on Purim. Zero. Why? Because Hashem isn't openly revealed anymore in Jewish history. Why? So the Ramban explains that the Nisim Niglaim, the open miracles of Pesach, were Megala the Nisim Nistar, were over revealed the hidden miracles that are not open, which means what? We think that miracles are different, that basically there's nature, and then miracles are things that happen once in a while, that God overturns nature. But the Ramban and the Nafshachai, many others explain that there's no fundamental difference between a miracle and nature. They're both miraculous, as in they're both the will of God. And when you start to realize that everything in life is miraculous, the fact that you are breathing, the fact that you exist, the fact that anything happens, the fact that you can think, the fact that you can breathe, everything in your life is miraculous. You start to live with depth and you don't have to find God by transcending this world. You find the transcendence in this world. You find the miraculous within and actually you find, it's like Einstein said that you can live as if everything is a miracle. You can live as if nothing is a miracle, but the choice is up to you. And when you start to, realize the opportunity in this life of viewing things through a deeper lens, of understanding that the whole system of Torah, of mitzvahs, of living a spiritual life is designed to help you live your ultimate self, of helping you become the best version of you, then everything changes. And if you want to think of it like this, you can think of it as when you live with the perspective that everything that you do is meaningful. Everything that you do has meaning. It's amazing. But there's a lot of responsibility. It means that everything you do has significance. Everything you do, everything you think, everything you eat, everything you say. When you live as if nothing has meaning, then there's no responsibility. Nothing matters. But there's no purpose in your life. And you get to choose how you live your life. But once you choose meaning, you start elevating your level of thought, your level of consciousness, your level of experience, your level of focus, the way that you see yourself. You start taking yourself seriously. You start respecting your own time. And then your life starts to change. And that's really why I wrote this book. The purpose of this book is to help you become your ultimate self. And I'll share a quick story as we close up. Now, I'm happy to take any questions afterwards, anything you want to ask. But a couple months ago, I was giving a keynote speech. And the way that these keynote speeches work is that the author, the speaker, whoever it is, he waits in the back, she waits in the back, and the person who's presenting has one microphone. And as they you know, introduce, as they present, they then walk off the stage and the speaker comes out with a second microphone. And the microphone's either in the back and the speaker comes up or the microphone's already up front on the podium. It doesn't really matter. And this time I'll never forget, there was only one microphone. And the speaker introduced, and as a speaker, as the person, the CEO of the company introduced, walked off, and I was coming up and there was, there was no second microphone. And I was waiting for the CEO to hand me the microphone, but he didn't. And I was like, what in the world? I've never seen this. Like I've spoken many, many, many times. I've never seen this. And instead of giving me the microphone, the CEO turns to the audience and says something I'm, I'll never forget. But before we get to that, I want to ask you a very, very simple question. If you look, I don't know if you saw the cover of the book, but the subtitle of the book is Lech Lecha, right? The journey to your ultimate self, Lech Lecha. When Hashem tells Avraham Lech Lecha, which means go, where does Hashem tell Avraham to go? He doesn't tell him. So all the commentaries, they all ask the commentators, they say, why didn't God tell Avraham where he was going? But the answer is that lech lecha also means what? Lech lecha means go, but lech go lecha to yourself. When you're going to yourself, when Avraham is told to go on his lech lecha journey, to journey towards his true purpose in life, which is the 10 challenges that he overcame, that was his journey towards greatness, towards becoming one of the others, the foundation of the others. There is no clear destination. You have, if you truly, truly, truly embark on trying to become your ultimate self, you have no idea who you'll become. Imagine going over to your younger self, your five-year-old self, and explaining to your five-year-old self who you are now, what you know now. You, 
your younger self wouldn't have the framework, the, the, the fundamental mental capacity to contain what you know, what you've experienced, who you are. So how can you possibly think that you can contain who you can become? Your future self, your ideal future self is beyond your wildest imagination, but you have to embark on the journey towards that self. And there's nothing like it. If you can overcome the fear of failure, the fear of what other people think, the fear that you're not good enough, the fear that what if this isn't what I think it will be, all the reasons that we tell ourselves, oh, that's not for me, I can't do that. You have no idea what you can become. And once you start heading down that path, once you start journeying, like the entire purpose of this book, the entire purpose of the journey towards himself is to help you become your ultimate self. And it's broken down to weekly, weekly chapters so that you don't get overwhelmed. You don't have to, you know, most people open up the books and they close them because it's overwhelming. But when it's a chapter a week, it's easy. It's easy. And there's a story in the beginning and there's summaries at the end. There's questions, there's action points. This book is designed to inspire, to transform, to help you live your ultimate self. And it can't end. Why can't I end? Why can't I end the talk? because there was a story, right? The, what happened to the microphone story? Can't end it. It's the number one rule of speaking. You don't start a story, not end it. Well, isn't that true for our lives? Like right now, we're, you're in the middle of your story. And so many people, they've stopped writing their story. They're in the middle of a story. But if you realize that Hashem gave you pen and paper and is not writing your story, but gave you free will to write your story, to become, you wouldn't stop in the middle of your story. You wouldn't unfinish or not complete your story. You would write the most. It's like, what if you thought of yourself as the hero of the story? It's like you watch a film, you, watch, you read a novel. It's like we all identify with the main character. Why? Because we all know that we're destined for greatness as well. We know that we're going through struggles. We know that life isn't perfect, but we also know that we're going to overcome them and we're going to grow because of them. We're going to achieve something amazing with our lives. What if you thought of yourself as the main character? Well, guess what? You are. You're the main character of your story and you're part of a bigger story, the Jewish story. And we're here. Like if you live your life contributing your greatness, your story to your community, to the Jewish people, to the world as a whole, that's the greatest life imaginable. And that's also, by the way, the Baal HaShem I say that the reason why Megillah, as the Megillah is so powerful is because if you read the story of Purim, just read it, it's not so great. But if you read it as like every single thing came together and every setup led to this and this led to this and because Vashti was killed and because Esther was there, because Mordechai was there, because this happened, all the pieces come together, you're like, Oh, this is the most amazing story of all time. So they say, write your own Megillah. Write your story. Start to see how everything in your life comes together. How what you thought was the worst thing ever was really the best thing ever. And how you didn't get that job, how you didn't meet this person, but you did meet that person, you went there. How all the pieces in your life come together and it changes you. Because you start to see how there's hashkach, there's divine providence in your life. And then you can say, I'm not only going to write my past story, I'm going to take that pen and start writing the rest of my story. So you know, my bracha to all of us is we should be inspired to journey to our ultimate selves, to truly strive to you know, take ourselves seriously and really hold ourselves to higher standards and try to become the greatest version of ourselves. If I'm not mistaken, the book is available at Israel's um, for a 10% discount. I think Mark's going to... Correct, correct. So I think that everyone here gets a 10% discount. Um, I really, really hope that you can all get the book. And if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to field them. But uh, regardless, it was such a pleasure to share some words of Torah, some words of thought with you. And I really hope we can continue taking this journey as you get the book. Have you have any questions for the rabbi? So if I could ask, perhaps, I don't want to take it out of context because perhaps each chapter builds on the previous one, but whether it's, this particular Parshat Shavuot is, is, is there one week that I, I don't know if you have, if there's a, if you have a, uh, 54 children, you have a favorite Parsha or whatever, but uh, is there is there one that you would perhaps want to give us an example of the message that would be quite profound and meaningful to us? That's the, the million dollar question, which has no real answer because 
the real answer to that question is that the book is designed to be a puzzle where every single chapter is a piece and each piece is isolatable where it's a beautiful expression of deep Torah. And I actually didn't mention this. I'm happy you asked that. But the way that the Sefer is designed is that it's actually a masterpiece. So if you, if you listen to music, anyone who knows how music works knows that it's actually, it's magic because music is just a clink and a clunk. You can see, you know, my piano and my, my guitar over here. So when you actually listen to music, you don't hear notes. You don't hear ding, dong, ding. You hear no, 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 no. You just hear the music, but it's actually comprised of pieces. But to be great music, you have to allow the pieces to disappear where you only see the music. But to create music, you have to understand how to put the pieces together, which by the way, is what Sphere Somer is all about. Because do we count, how many days are we supposed to count through Sphere Somer? The Torah says count 50 days. Yeah. Says 50, right? How many do we count? 49. Who here has counted 50? I hope nobody, because you're not supposed to count the 50. Why? But the Torah says, because the way that you create something perfect, something transcendent, is you take finite pieces, you put them together, and it comprises something that transcends the sum of the pieces. So we don't count the 50th, Hashem does. And what is the 50th? What is the expression of transcendence? That's Ma'an Torah. That's where Hashem expresses himself, and we experience Hashem, and we experience the Torah, which, by the way, is a really, really cool principle. The Maharal explains that the world is built off of sevens. The natural world is built off of sevens. There's seven days in the week, seven lights in the spectrum of lights, seven notes in the musical scale. Seven is the number of the natural. Why? Because we live in a three-dimensional world, right? Right, think about a cube, right? Six, right, right left, front, back, up, down. It's three-dimensional cube, three sides, six, right? Seven is the interconnectivity of all those pieces. Shabbos is the seventh, right? Shabbos interconnects, so it connects the week together. But what's also, by the way, just, it's cool. Shabbos is the seventh day. It's the sandwich. So you have six days on each side, it's the seventh. It's also the center. That's why you can make Havgalah until Tuesday because Shabbos is also the center of the week. So the concept of the seventh is that, because you can have six sides lying on the floor. The fact that they're connected, you have to connect the pieces together. But what happens when you connect the pieces together in the right way? Something transcends the sum of the pieces. So you have music transcends the notes. You have the soul, when the body is healthy, it's together in the right way, you have a soul. When you have a radio, you put all the pieces together, you get a radio frequency. The idea of something transcendent, that's the seventh, right? The seventh creates what? The eighth. So the eighth is lamala min hateva. It is the, the soul. It's the music. It's the radio frequency. It's that which transcends the sum of the pieces. So spheres Omer, there's a famous question, are we counting days or weeks, right? Because it's seven days, it's also seven weeks. But it's seven, seven. It's the concept of sevenness. It's bringing the seven days together, which creates a week, and then bringing seven weeks together. Shavuos also means weeks. So it's, you know, Sheva, seven, also literally seven and weeks. What's the concept? Because what happens when you have the eighth? The eighth is, the, you know, after the seven. But what's the eighth in, in Sphere of Omer? It's the seventh... It's the eighth after the seventh week. So it's the beginning of the eighth week and it's the 50th day. So what happens on the eighth? We experience Hashem, we experience Ma'anto, we experience Shavuos. That's why also eighth is a very like, what else happens on the eighth day? Prismila happens on the eighth day. You uplift something that's purely physical. The, you know, the human aver, the organ of, a procreation can be purely physical, but you uplift it. Shmona also, Hanukkah is the holiday of, of miracles, the holiday of, of Shmona, it's eight days, but also what's the miracle of Hanukkah happen with what? Shemin, same root as Shmona. So it's a very, very deep concept. But the idea of, and just to get back to what we're, the, the question that you asked, the idea of the Sefer is that there's a bunch of pieces each chapter is a beautiful chilek of Torah, a beautiful idea that delves into something truly, truly deep. But it not only practically interconnects with all the other chapters, every single chapter has countless footnotes that connect you to all of the places in the book where the, these ideas come up, which helps you deepen the concepts. And the purpose is like this. True depth 
is impossible to hand over in a single share, a single chapter, a single expression, because to understand something, you need to also understand something else. And so often, if you hear someone who's really, really intelligent, you will realize that to understand a lot of things that they're saying, you have to understand other things. But how do you understand those other things? So they often won't tell you how to understand those other things. You have to figure it out yourself. You have to listen to their other lectures, but you have to find out where they talk about those ideas. You don't know. So you're basically going on a wild goose chase, trying to find how to basically put the pieces together. I spent literally a decade doing that, but I wanted to find a solution. Now, the, there, there's a positive and a negative to what I did. The positive is that I've given you the channels. So I've given you, so to speak, the trees, but also the root system, where you can see how the roots interconnect with everything else. Like beneath each chapter, all, this, all the footnotes connect you to all other chapters where these ideas become expressed, where you can deepen your understanding of certain concepts and ideas, where there's unique expressions and how all the pieces come together. Now, that makes it easy for you. Now, it takes away the work. And the reason why you know, I've become these ideas is because of the work I put in, but practically most people won't do the work. So there's much, 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 much more work to be done. And what I've tried to do is balance of giving you enough that you can start putting the pieces together without doing all the work for you, but giving you enough that you aren't dissuaded from taking that journey, from really going beneath the surface. Because to make a canyon, to acquire knowledge, you have to break, you have to push, you have to struggle. Intellect is difficult. Imagination is easy, right? When you're diving from an asteroid, what happens? Your mind starts to, you know, you know, a lot of people, they take three steps back and they wake up at Moden, right? They wake up when they're bad, like, how did I get here? Because when you're only using intellect, you have to constantly push. Imagination goes without effort, it just flows. But when you can make intellect enjoyable, inspiring, accessible, and clear enough, you allow people to still push, but to actually be motivated to do it. So my favorite idea in the book is the fact that all of the ideas are not just random, cool concepts, or random dvartlach, random divreto, random ideas, but it's part of a system, a balanced system, a nuanced system that interconnects and become something far greater than just a bunch of separate chapters. Thank you. There was a question in the chat about what the gentleman with the microphone said. I, I don't know if uh, you wrapped that up, the, the anecdote. <laughs> so the answer, so someone, it's a great question. So the answer to that, there's always one person who asked that question. I would say, I'd say a couple times I get away with it. Never when I take questions. Whenever I take questions, I never get away with it. And the answer is that there is no ending to that story. It's, it's a construct. And the purpose of it, it's a great, great story. And there's, there's usually, um, usually a couple of people in every audience who want to know the end of the story. There's always one person who has the courage to ask. And once you ask, you realize... The, the purpose of the story, when I first heard that concept, I heard that story, so I think, in, I think it's on a TED Talk, but it, it blows your mind because it's so true. Like you would never start a story, like you never publish uh, a chapter without finishing. You never publish a story without finishing. You never, like the purpose of a story is to create a system that creates a problem, and then the story goes forward, there's struggles along the way, and you solve the problem. Now, that's, that's so powerful. It's why people love stories. But why do we love it? Because we're drawn towards that concept because it's so deep. It's so deep in terms of being part of the human experience. But then we don't apply it. The next step, which is that's actually the human story that you need to turn your life into. It's like whenever you read a novel, whenever you watch a film, whenever you're tapped into that, there's something epic there. And you think for a moment, like, I want my life to be like that. But then you go back to your normal life. But don't go back to your normal life. Like, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm very, very practical. I, you know, I coach CEOs and high executives. And I help them achieve the extraordinary. This is not just, you know, dreams of, of lofty, you know, pretend that challenges aren't real and strive. But here's the thing, when you balance the crazy imaginative dreams of achieving the incredible with practical steps of actually pursuing it, 
life becomes amazing. Most people, they stop it. They either are cynical, so they don't buy into the inspiration or they buy into it, but then they get lost because, okay, how do I actually do it? Like I'm, I'm married with kids. I can't quit my job. I can't just pursue my dreams. I can't try to make a difference in the world. What is, how does that look like? What I always tell people is that you don't need to be changing the world to becoming great. You need to be working on yourself. Are you learning? Are you working on your emotional stability? Are you exercising? Are you trying to become financially stable? Are you building amazing relationships? Are you spiritually focused and aware? Are you trying to talk to Hashem and connect to Hashem? That's becoming great. The more that you grow, the more you can contribute to others. But the real starting point is saying, I want to live a great story. I want to write my story. I want to act out the hero in the story that says, I'm capable, worthy, and destined to be the focus of something important. And you're built the cell and alchemy. You have a chalik alchemy within you. You are literally, you have something infinite within you. You are infinite. And your unique role in this world is for you to discover that's the greatest joy. Like real happiness is the process and journey of growth. It's not once you get there. Because once you get there, you'll be unhappy. Because you'll say, what, what now? Like anyone who's achieved anything says, like, I spent all my life wanting to get here. I got here and just not like, I'm not happy. And the reason is because happiness is a state of being while you are pursuing the truth. And the truth is that you'll never be perfect. You can always become more. And once you learn how to enjoy that journey, you learn reading, you learn, you learn to love reading, you learn to love writing, you learn to love teaching, you learn to love thinking, you learn to love, by the way, so many people, the reason why learning is difficult is that they have so much clutter in their head like they have so many ideas that what I did when I was younger, this will change your life. Start writing down everything you believe, everything you think, everything that you actually think you know, get it outside of your head. You start to realize that you don't even know what you know. You think you know what you know, but you don't know what you know. And there are so many internal contradictions and you don't actually have fully developed thoughts, so many things you believe and think are because someone told you them. And not to say they were wrong, but you haven't owned them because you haven't actually thought them through, questioned it, deepened it, qualified it, and built it into your actual framework of thinking. So you don't have, like, for example, I, I do podcasts, I do interviews, I speak on you know international platforms and stages. I can answer any question people ask me, even if I'm not, if I'm, even if I'm not prepared for it. But the reason is because I'm not actually thinking of an answer to their question on the spot. I've, I have a story of thought. The story is a system. The system is a fundamental principle-based system that spent, it took years to develop, but it gets to the underlying core of you know, potent fundamental ideas. When someone plugs in a question, I plug in the system. So I'm not like in the moment coming up with something brilliant. I'm just expressing the oneness of thought into the question. So when so many people, they hear people, you know, on platforms, on stages answering, you know, questions and they think like where they fed them beforehand, how's that working? But the way it works is that you actually become thought, you become ideas. And the way to do that is to make a real kingdom to own your ideas, which means that you have to actually think them through write them down, process, start to actually say, I don't want to read, I want to learn. I don't want to listen to a lecture. I want to understand the lecture. In order to do that, you have to start building your mind. Now, your mind is an interconnected neural framework, but to actually build it, you have to go to the root and start building it from, now, you know, I started when I was young. When I was 18, I started the system where I wrote everything down everything, every idea I had, every lecture I heard, every book I read, every safe I read, every shear I attended, everything. If I ever had an idea, I wrote it down. I started having files for everything, every mitzvah, every concept, every sugya, every question, every aspect of life, in psychology, in philosophy, in mathematics, in all realms of thought. And every lecture I gave, and I started to have files, and I started to interconnect the files. I started to say, well, this doesn't make sense with that. I have to qualify. Oh, wow. Like, this is actually a really cool idea. This, And you start to realize that the, the, the process of building your mind is something that only you can do. So when someone gives you a lecture, they're giving you their research, their understanding, their perspective. You don't want to absorb that. You want to digest it. To digest it means you break it down, you take out the nutrients, you extract what you don't 
agree with. Now, you know, honesty and humility means you don't do that first. You have to be egoless to say, first, I'm going to try to understand, not judge, understand, which means I have to subtract myself from the equation. After I subtract myself from the equation, I can see it objectively. And then I can try to take everything that's good, add it to my system, and then extract it. It's like eating. You, you know, take the nutrients, extract the bad. Most people are either sponges or they create blockades. They either say, I accept everything or I accept nothing. But being thoughtful means being willing to extract the good and being willing to understand what should be expelled. Um, I did see a hand go up. I think it was Shayla. Did someone have a question? I saw a hand go up before. Oh, am I giving? Am I going to give classes going through the books? That's a great question. Um, so at this stage, I am, you know, my schedule is so busy with speaking and traveling and writing and, and teaching and coaching. And still getting a PhD at the University of Chicago. Let's not forget that. So I was very, very. I was debating doing a weekly class going through the book, but at this stage, I'm not. It's definitely something that I will do, something I was going to I mean, my, my goal wasn't to have a class going through the book, but it was going to have, this is what I was going to do. I was going to have everyone read the chapter beforehand, and then we'd have a live Zoom every single week where I would go deeper into that chapter, things that aren't included, where it'd be like, why I included what I included, how I wrote this chapter, a lot of ideas that didn't make it into the book, things that you know deepen and build on the content. So it becomes much more than just you know a normal book club where you just read through the book, but it would give you a much more enhanced, expansive experience of the ideas. Um, and obviously now that I'm saying that, I obviously want to do it again. So you know, Bezra Shem, we will definitely be doing that sometime in the future. Um, so you know, keep your eyes and ears open. So I, I want to wrap up. I want to thank you so much for both your inspiration and for ultimately the message you delivered for us. And I think if I can quote, uh, which will sum up perfectly. Um, oh, there is a question here. Do you have a, do you have a podcast? So I have, so the way that my system works is I have hundreds and hundreds of classes and, 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 and articles and, and lectures and all the, I do podcasts and lots of other people's podcasts. So everything's on my website. My website is shmuelreichman.com. It's my name, shmuelreichman.com. That's where you can order a book. I think in Canada, um, the best option would be to get it in stores from Israel, just because of shipping. So Israel's is where you can get the book. Um, all my content, I have a, I have a, self-development course, which really synthesizes, you know, Tony Robinson's high performance psychology with Torah thoughts called Self Mastery Academy. That's on my website. Um, all the lectures I give, all the things I do, all my updates, that's on my website and my email list where I send out weekly content and I send out updates. It's also on my website. So everything, if you have any, if you want to continue learning the journey besides just the book, um, so my website is a great place to do that, shmuelreichman.com. But, um, but I do really hope that everyone gets a copy of the book and I do really look forward to taking this journey with you. And here is a very concise book review from Michelle. The book, The Journey to Your Ultimate Self is brilliant. I have an extensive library. However, Kol Kavod to Rabbi Shmuel Reichman, superb. Michelle, so. just for the record, <laughs> Michelle is an amazing, amazing person, a close friend. She ordered two copies of the book the second it came out, and it took many, many months for her to get it because the book sold out before Canada got their copies, so she had to wait for the second print. Um, and I sent her some handwritten inscriptions, which, uh, you know, she is, uh, she is amazing, so I really appreciate that, Michelle. Well, I'm happy you said something. Hello, Shmuel. It's lovely to hear you. And, uh, you know, I was honored to have you do one of the 12 shiurim for my brother in the months we had uh, Adar Aleph and Adar Bet. So I had 12 shiurim and it was wonderful to have you do one for me. People were enthralled. Um, I have to tell you, they're still talking about it. Um, I know my friend right now, my, my friend and my dear neighbor, I always call her uh, the sister I never had. Hannah, you're there, Annette Britras. Um, she uh, enjoyed you the first time and I'm sure she enjoyed you tonight. And it was just wonderful. And I love your story with the microphone. 
<laughs> but I really, I really wish you'd come with an end. I have to come up with that. By the way, for the record, everyone who's listening, Michelle was the one who asked the question, what happened to the microphone in right. our previous lecture? So there's always one person, and this time it's someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I respect Michelle for at least giving me the chance of getting away with it without uh, someone asking me the question. But I do, I do. I mean, I have to come up with an ending that really answers the question while right. still telling people the truth that it's still kind of true. But well, um, well, one last thing, I don't want to take up too much of your time. It's been a long night for you. But uh, one last thing, um, you do this master class. Is that the correct terminology? So it is a master class. It's called it's called Self Master Academy, but it's the same concept and the same format of a master class. It's a ten week course that really is designed. We've had hundreds of people go through it. It's designed to give people the fundamental principles of really living. Like most of these systems are surface level, so they'll give you strategies, tactics, and I, know, I think they're good. I've gone through all of them. I'm a big fan, but in order to really make it work and make, and make it synergize with Torah, it has to be built off of principles. It has to be built off of a system that works. And it has to be something which doesn't just give you a bunch of tactics that contradict each other, but a harmonious system that is designed to not just be selfish and help you feel good about yourself, but really help you unlock your true potential and devote your life to something bigger than yourself. So it is a masterclass. Uh, it's 10 masterclasses. Um, and uh, anyone who's here is interested, I think you'll really enjoy it. You can feel free to reach out with questions. But um, yeah, Michelle, I'm trying to find the time in my calendar when I can do this. So if I can just ask you, sorry, um, is it once a week? How does it work? Very quickly, Shmuel. Very, very quickly. It's pre recorded. It's pure quiet. It's about 45 minutes of video per week and also has worksheets and there are tons and tons of bonuses and bonus content, but it's 45 right. minutes of video per week with worksheets to help you personalize and implement it. And it's pre-recorded so you keep it forever. So people, lots of people love to do it, you know, with each week, it's a 10 week course, but there are people who will, you know, take a break, who'll do it on their own time. And you also get to keep it forever. So people always go through it and, you know, go through it again and again and again. Time Excellent. Well, I look forward to looking into that. And I think it's something that I will enjoy. Um, I'm, I'm a born student. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter being a mother and a grandmother and all the rest of it, and a very young one at that. I still love learning. I, I, I thrive on learning. And I, your book is actually right beside my bed. Oh, wow. And uh, I'm studying it. I'm not reading it. I am that's studying the, it. I, that's the right way to read it, to study okay. it, to be a life. So thank you so much. And to ever the gentleman who sponsored you this evening, thank you so much. And you're an absolute joy. And I look forward to seeing you again in the very near future. Alex, God bless so you. And only the best for you and your family. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who participated tonight. So once again, that's a uh, at the book is the journey to your ultimate self, available at uh, Israel's Yaka, a ten percent uh, discount to Beit members, and the simple to remember website is shmuelrechman.com. Is that correct? Shmuelrechman.com, correct. Great. So I want to thank you so much. Thank you for the inspiration. I want to wish everybody here and wish you a uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and Mevorach and Shabbat Sameach and Kol Mikol Tuv and we, we should all daven for peace in the world. Amen. This is what we need to do. We must daven for peace in the world.